This is one of those happy days when you get to announce something that's just spectacular in every way. There's no buts. This is, this is a, an amazing facility. For those of you who saw my reaction when I, I walked in, this is the first time I've, I've, I've been here in a long time, certainly since it was fixed up, and I just can't believe it. I'm sure each of you had the same reaction, too. Um, before I begin, um, let me just say that to get things like this off the ground requires um, the work of, uh, of many people, both in the private sector and in the public sector, and, and this is really a, a wonderful example of a public-private partnership that worked well and will work well for generations in our city. Um, so let me give credit where credit is due, uh, right up front. Uh, there are a lot of people on the development team. They include um, our DPF Commissioner Larry Worden, um, Renee Dufour, who's in charge of uh, our Department of Parks and Recreation and Beaches. Pat Sullivan, who is in charge of the Office of Housing and Community Development here in the City of New Bedford. City Council is Bruce Duart and Brian Gomes, um, as well as some of the private sector folks who worked here, the, the architects Bargman, Hendry, and Archetype Inc., the general contractor, uh, which was Paul Rogan and Company, and the site contractor, which was Webster Construction. Um, as I walked in today, I couldn't help uh, but remember a conversation I had a few months ago in another one of the buildings in the old Vogue complex, as people know this complex. Uh, and it was over at Youth Build, which, as you know, is a is a wonderful organization that does youth outreach projects and, as the name uh, implies, puts kids to work in ways that are meaningful and constructive and that contribute to the community. Uh, I remember one conversation I had with one young man who had dropped out of high school who said the following. We were talking about, about how uh, today's youth, as, as it were, uh, as they are, uh, have trouble finding things to do and what that means. And he said to me it was this, and this, this observation really stuck with me. He said, you know, when you have nothing to do, everything becomes a drama. So if you don't have a job, if you don't have some activity that occupies your time, if you don't have something to devote your life to, and you end up with idle time, whether it's outside or inside or something, everything becomes, every little slight, every, uh, every little um, uh, controversy becomes a big deal. So that means when you're hanging around the block and somebody looks at you the wrong way, those are fighting words. When someone, you know, doesn't give you the respect you're due, doesn't greet you the right way, isn't as pleasant as they, they ought to be, that becomes a conflict. And when you have, and he said this, when you have a job, when you have an activity, when you have something that you can call your own and be passionate about, those things are inconsequential. Those things mean nothing. You have the context, the perspective, to put those things in place and to move on and to be a productive person and not to get sucked into the kinds of things that we battle against all the time, gangs and drugs and crime. And so uh, I'm reminded of that conversation today because this is a place that will give kids something to do something to devote themselves to, something to occupy their energy and their efforts. And that's what makes it wonderful. This is a fantastic facility. This is something that everyone will become emotionally invested in and take care of. It's a wonderful, uh, it's a wonderful reuse of a property that's been here since the 1930s and that has had many memories over the years. Some of the great Vogue teams uh, of, of years past played here. 
uh, and there are memories uh, yet to come. These gentlemen that are standing behind you and the others that will follow them and the great tradition of New Bedford High basketball will, come, will remember years from now the time they played on this court and say, you, you know, remember when so-and-so used to play here? Remember we had that game there? This will be the place where memories are formed, where childhoods will be formed, where adults ultimately will be formed. And so we have a lot to be proud of uh, here, and, and I'm just uh, I'm pleased to be in a position where uh, I can announce those things. I, I will note a couple of things. These things, again, don't happen without great teamwork. Um, they also don't happen without funding, funding from the city uh, in the way of in-kind services, the kind that, uh, for instance, Larry Worden's shop provided here. But they also, uh, what also matters, too, is uh, funding from the federal government. Much of the funding that, um, that made this facility possible came through community development block grants, which are basically um, uh, funds that come directly from the federal government to cities like ours year in, year out, to be put to the best uses, to be used to help community groups, to build capital projects like parks uh, and recreational facilities like these. Those funds are being cut. Uh, and we have to be um, we have to be vigilant about that. We have to we have Congressman Keating is here. Congressman Frank will get up and speak in a second. Uh, we can speak to this. It's really important that we maintain that the federal government maintains uh, its its role in cities like ours that are struggling for capital investment that need dollars so that we can rebuild places like this. So that's all. That's an important part of this picture that I would be remiss without saying. My role in this is just to introduce people. Um, I've been in office approximately, well, six weeks, and uh, I don't deserve any of the credit here. Um, we put the finishing touches on it, but the heavy lifting uh, was done uh, by the two men uh, behind me, the three men behind me. Where's Pat? You're not going to speak, Pat? <laughs> I'm not putting any pressure on you. By the two men behind me, uh, Congressman Frank, uh, and Mayor Lang, um, and they, uh, I asked Mayor Lang to, to be here today uh, because he did the heavy lifting here. It wasn't my administration. Uh, this thing was on the goal line when I took office, and this was a very, very important project to him uh, and to his administration, and he deserves uh, a round of applause uh, for his, his hard work. So if you could give him a hand. And uh, I'd like to call him up to, uh, to say a few words about the facility and the, the efforts that went into it. Thank you. I want to thank the mayor for asking me to come here today. I, this is uh, a, a, a very important project that we spent a lot of time and effort on, so I'm very proud to be here, I, to the point where I asked uh, Gig to come by to see it today, because it's really just a spectacular a spectacular facility. I also love the idea that we have Coach Tarpey, his team, uh, here with all the uh, assistant coaches and then all the different stakeholders in our community that are going to make this uh, building a tremendous success and it will uh, shine like a, a beacon, a lantern for all the, uh, the children in this, uh, this uh, central part of the West End. I want to make note of the fact that this, uh, this, is a, this campus is a bookend to the uh, Lewis Temple project that we've done and you can actually see from the front door of, uh, of this facility, the Lewis Temple uh, facility and then if you go out or, or the uh, Lewis Temple uh, uh, neighborhood and then if you go out if you get any kind of a vantage point you literally can see the entire West End from this, from this great uh, facility. I want to give a little bit of background uh, very quickly, the, the history then, then the near history on this and then say thank you to a uh, a few people. The first thing I want to tell you is that this building originally was built uh, in 1937. Now the Volk campus, the, the main Volk school building, opened in 1931 and there was a need for an auditorium which also included a gymnasium. And this was built by the, uh, during, a, it was a WPA project built during the Depression in a uh, concerted effort by the federal government and the city government, and it was under Mayor Ashley. And the key here, was, and, and by the way, I want to tell you that Mayor Ashley, when interviewed, leaving office after 32 years as mayor, was asked for his great achievements. And he said, well, one was water, clearly water. The other was uh, getting the Fairhaven uh, New Bedford Bridge situated and built. 
But then he said, my greatest achievement of all was the vocational, New Bedford Vocational High School, and uh, being able to provide an educational opportunity for young men and women who not only would take uh, the, uh, the academics extremely seriously, but also technical skills seriously, and go out and begin earning uh, a living as skilled tradespeople. And I, I think that's very fitting because what, what he saw as his greatest achievement back when he uh, uh, retired in the uh, late 30s is something that we're still striving to try and do today, which is provide the greatest educational opportunities for our children. He saw this building as an educational opportunity, as all of us do, and is, and is why this building is, is going to be reopened. This is a gymnasium, it's an auditorium, but really it's a classroom. It's a classroom to learn all of life's lessons, as well as it will have study halls and classrooms in it as well. But the fact of the matter is we're reopening a great classroom here today. Now, in 19, it, this was christened on December 28, 1937. And uh, it, the cost at that time was $143,000 to build this building. And the city share of it, there was, there was uh, I'm sure, I'm sure we wouldn't have paid as much if Congressman Frank represented us then, but we paid uh, $8,700 as our share. If, if uh, Barney Frank had been our, our congressman, we would have paid less than half of that, I'm sure. But the fact of the matter is, it seemed like a pretty fair deal at the time. I still think it does today. The cost to renovate this uh, building as a result of Congressman Frank's efforts, and that really is what it comes down to. Without Congressman Frank, we wouldn't be here right now, uh, is uh, about $1.5 million in two separate grants that we received uh, in order to do the job that needed to be done. Now, I, I want to say uh, something else about uh, the fact that there, there have been so many great individual athletes that have been in and out of, out of this uh, facility. Uh, clearly, Andre McCoy, uh, many, many legendary boxers have trained uh, in this facility over the years. Uh, Bucky Vincent, as well as Manny Burgo, ran their, uh, their Golden Gloves uh, championship programs out of this uh, building. He had great Vogue uh, basketball teams, as Mayor Mitchell uh, indicated, as well as tremendous uh, plays and all kinds of interesting activities. But when the uh, building was first opened, it was dedicated as an auditorium to Edgar uh, R. Hammond. And uh, there's a plaque outside, it's, it's a beautiful plaque and it has a bunch of names on it, but it doesn't really explain who Edward, uh, Edgar R. Hammond was. And I'm just gonna take one minute uh, to tell you. Edgar Hammond died about uh, four months before the building was dedicated. And he had been the Volk chairperson of the Volk board uh, since its inception back in 1908. So he had served 29 years as the chairman of the, of the New Bedford Vocational High School Board. And uh, he was a architect and builder by trade. He designed this building. He designed the, all the vocational buildings here. He also, though, which is very, very interesting, in eight, 1918 was named the, uh, uh, to be on an advisory board by the governor at the time to uh, help train disabled veterans coming back from World War I. And, and it was uh, infirmed and disabled veterans, and he was uh, a key member of the advisory board. So he did public service for a very long time. He actually served on the New Bedford School Committee before he became chairman of Volk. But the interesting thing about Mr. Hammond was, uh, Calb Hammond was his uh, dad. And uh, they lived right here on uh, North Street. And what they were, were an architectural firm in the city. So what I, what I just want to tell you is, is this. It's very interesting. Every day we live and wa walk by Mr. Hammond's contributions to the city. Other than this great building, uh, he designed the addition for the uh, City Hall. Uh, the Taylor School, the Phillips Avenue School, uh, many other schools throughout the uh, city, both public and private schools, uh, public buildings were designed by this firm. So he was a household name at the time, and that's why his plaque uh, was, uh, was dedicated at that time. It was just uh, after his uh, passing away at age 83, and clearly uh, there was a tremendous amount of uh, honor and homage paid to him, as there still is in seeing his plaque when you walk in to this uh, building, which at the time was known as an auditorium. Now, what I want to uh, explain is the near history. The near history is this. There have been other attempts to renovate this building. And in fact, uh, within a couple of years before I was elected mayor, this building had been almost finished, ready to go, and then was, uh, uh, was arsoned, was burned. And when I first became mayor, Pat Sullivan, and Pat deserves as much or more uh, credit for why we're here today as, as, uh, as anyone.
including Mr. Hammond, because quite frankly, we were going to tear down this building. And Pat came in to see me and he said, we've got a real problem, a real dilemma here. We've got the uh, Hillman Street uh, Center, this uh, great facility, which we were just so close to opening up, and then we had the fire. And the fire has done extensive damage to the point now where there's a question as to whether or not it, it is salvageable. Let's go over, take a look at it. Tell me what you think, Scott. We'll go from there. And we came over, looked at it, and the floor, you know, the congressman can, uh, can tell you about this. The floor was uh, completely buckled and burned. Joists at the ceiling burned. Uh, many, many, anything that, was, anything that was flammable had been, uh, had been consumed in this uh, fire, deliberately set. Uh, by someone who clearly doesn't understand the great significance of having children come together uh, in, in, uh, in athletic competition and, and in social settings. Uh, the decision was made, though, that day that we were going to go ahead and rebuild this uh, center as a symbol to everybody in the city, that the city is not going to take a back step in any way, in any way, anywhere. So Pat had the responsibility then of coming up with everything from RFPs to figuring out how we uh, move ahead with this. And then it, without Congressman Frank having the same vision, we're not here. Because the federal government putting in $1.5 million allowed us to do this, uh, this project. Who else uh, is involved in this? All our city employees. There's not a city employee that worked for DPW under Larry Warden and some who worked for, uh, under DPI under Ron LaBelle who didn't have their hand in this. Uh, a fellow like John Perry was here on a regular basis. Uh, Joe Sylvia is here today. Everyone pitched in. And, I, and I'm talking about then turning it over to Renee Dufour to figure out the details, R Russ Moran now to help run it. But everybody's had a piece in this because we believe in this project so much. It's important to have the best facilities for our kids. It's an educational issue, nothing less. And that's why, that's why this is a great facility. Now, the last thing I want to say is that this is a tip of the iceberg regarding what Congressman Frank did day in, day out uh, for our city over the uh, past three decades that he's represented us. He, he understood, still does, but he understood, and I expect in the private sector he'll even be more forthright and, and forceful in some of these issues. The fact of the matter is he knows our city neighborhood by neighborhood, kid by kid, community by community. He saw this opportunity and jumped on it. That $1.5 million could have gone somewhere else easy enough. It could have been eaten by some other project somewhere in the United States. It came here and you see the results. A month from now, when Mayor Mitchell is, is in here coming to see a game or whatever it might be, you'll see every kid, every community represented here. Everyone will have an ID. Everyone will have school books with them. But this moves the community forward. So that's why I love this project. And, I, and I'm, I'm very, very grateful to the mayor for asking me to come by and speak because I've been thinking about what I'd speak when this opened up for three and a half years now. And it's, it's great to have it open. Now, I also think that Pat should take up the mayor's uh, request to come up and speak because he can tell you about some of the day in day out back and forth we had to make sure this would be a great project. So thanks very much Mayor, thanks for asking me to come by, thanks Congressman. Pat, are you sure you don't want to come up and speak? Oh, okay, all right. Um, without uh, further ado, let me call up Congressman Frank and just say one word uh, about this. This is in many ways, a victory, a continuation of your victory lap this year, Congressman Frank, and uh, it, is, it is heartfelt. Uh, Congressman Frank has gone to bat for the city and this region for over 20 years, and uh, this is just a, uh, a, a tangible manifestation of his, one of his many efforts. Um, federal dollars really do make a difference in a city like ours, and you have it right here before you. And it wouldn't happen. And this stuff just doesn't fall. The money from the federal government just doesn't fall like, like rain. It, is, it's, um, it, it requires hard work. It requires advocacy. It requires the kind of effective advocacy that Congressman, Congressman Frank has consistently given this region year in and year out. And uh, I'm pleased to, uh, to congratulate him and thank him for his efforts and ask him just to say a few words uh, about, uh, about those efforts. My thanks to both Scott Lang and Mayor Mitchell for their very kind words. And this is really, a, some of you may not understand how extraordinary an event it is, but I got here just a few minutes late and found that Scott Lang was already here. Now that's never happened to me <laughs> in all my years. So 
this must be a pretty big deal. And it is. There are people who try to create a kind of antagonism between the business community, the private sector, and government, the public sector. The answer is they have to work together and they each have very important roles the other doesn't do. Yes, wealth is created, things are manufactured, services are performed by the private sector with people trying to make a profit. That's a good thing. That's how we become prosperous. But we're a civilized people and we live together in crowded urban areas and some of us have done better than others. And some of us have done well because of our talents and some of us have done well because we were lucky enough to be born in certain ways. And even with our talents, there are people who, nobody chose to be born dumb or awkward or lacking certain skills. We are all born and we then try to do the best we can and some will do better than others. And in a civilized society, we take some of the wealth, a small part of the wealth that the private sector creates, and we use it for two things. And both are exemplified here. First, we use it to improve the quality of our own lives. I don't care how rich you are, you can't clean up the air you breathe. You can't clean up the water. You can't build yourself a better highway. You can't build yourself a train that'll get us from here to Boston. And I'm determined one of these days we will, and I'll keep working on that. And then there are people among us who don't do as well. You know, I hear some politicians today complain about, well, people on poor stamps. You know who most of the people on poor stamps are? They're children. I don't care how angry you are at their parents. What are you gonna do, take it on at some five-year-old and let him or her go to bed hungry? Well, one of the things we do is to come together and to provide for the community and for the young people in particular, places where they can do constructive things where they can have fun, where they can get to know each other, where they can meet each other and compete. You know, there's a certain amount of competitiveness built into young people, particularly young males. Let's just have a, an atmosphere and an, an arena in which that can happen. And it came with federal dollars. Yeah, this is in fact federal dollars that came here. Now, I know there are people who think federal dollars might be better spent elsewhere, like continuing the war in Afghanistan. Uh, my own view is that we spend them very well here, and I am very confident in all I did. Look, I didn't do the planning. I didn't do any of the uh, heavy lifting here. I had, we had very able people here in the city who had the plan. I just had to go and try and persuade other people to give them the money. But I did it confident in the first place that this was going to be well used. Anybody who had been here, I hope there were pictures of how this place looked like there had been a, a like bombs and fires, yeah, there they are. This place was one of the worst looking places I've ever seen. And uh, to see what it's been done, it is a great tribute to the people in the city who supervise this work, to the workmen. And, you know, it's a public sector, private sector, private contractors worked on this with city funds. It was a good example of that cooperation. So I knew it would be well done and I know it's gonna be well used. So uh, uh, as I contemplate doing few of these things, to be honest, and not entirely unhappily. Um, I uh, will be remembering some of the things that I was able to participate in, and, and, and the image of this great gym floor and this building and that clock compared to where it was, yeah, uh, that makes me feel good about my work, but in order to make all of us feel good about our country and our capacity as a country, both to create wealth in the private sector and then to come together and improve the quality of our lives living together. Thanks, everybody. Well, a couple of things. Let me just close with a, a couple of programming notes. First of all, there are flyers going around that uh, announce a grand opening of, um, of this gym. So there's an open house, let me just mention, uh, this Wednesday from 2 to 5, and this Friday from 2 to 5, two open houses. And then uh, next week is school vacation week, and this gym will be open for school vacation week, which would be great. So the timing of this event is, is terrific. Um, so the guys you see behind me uh, have a big week. They, uh, they're having a great year, if you don't know, um, uh, under Coach Tarpey and his staff are doing a great job this year as always. Uh, this week's a big week. So tomorrow, 
they play at Brockton, the number one rated team in the state. Um, and uh, you guys lost by what, four points last time, Tom, to, to Brockton? So they're ready this time. Uh, they're ready. We're going to see, you're going to see a, a great game tomorrow night from these gentlemen right here. And then Friday, uh, we have the resumption of, in my view, the finest, uh, the preeminent uh, high school rivalry in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, Durfee New Bedford basketball. Uh, it's a tradition that goes back a long, long time. It is the best rivalry in the state. Uh, with apologies to teams up in Boston, there's nothing quite like uh, Durfee New Bedford basketball. That's Friday, that's, at, uh, that's here, that's home. So I ask everybody to turn out uh, for these guys. They're working hard, they're having a great season, and they're great kids. So let's, uh, let's get out and support them. Thank you very much.